Ah, Monica, una cosa non... Ok, non ti sento più. Non ti sento più. Good morning everyone and happy carbon pricing day. You never heard about this uh, uh, this day but uh, it's a first. So today we will start uh my name is Virginia Fiume. I'm the coordinator of Humans and I'm uh, uh, coordinating the European network around the European Citizen Initiative StopGlobalWarming.eu and uh, today we launch a very special marathon that's gonna last for until tonight around 10, 10 30 so we'll keep you company throughout the day. Um, we start this marathon uh, supposedly ahead of the EU summit that uh, is not happening tomorrow, uh, but we thought it was a good idea to, to do something to push the European leaders uh, to commit to the topic of carbon pricing that's been in the public debate for, for, for ages. Uh, so the, the structure of the day is a series of events that are gonna happen throughout the stopglobalwarming.eu website, which we recommend you to check out and share with your friends, uh, to explore the topic of carbon pricing and the potential for its actual implementation from multiple perspectives. I will not to take too much time, but I give immediately the floor to Marco Cappato and Monica Frassoni, who will uh, welcome us and introduce uh, the important uh, uh, political and civic meaning, meaning of the day that, uh, that we're going to share together. And, uh, and then Avi Candeli, who is the creative director of Stop Global Warming .eu for a quick introduction. And then we will deep dive immediately into the data that are the basis of this initiative. So, Marco, uh, Monica. Mo Monica, so first. Monica first. Monica first. I'm uh... I'm a Trumpian guy. Monica first. <laughs> I knew this was coming. Good morning, everyone from um, from the Brussels, uh, which is enjoying the last uh, summer sun before its usual rain comes back. Um, and this is extremely uh, appropriate, actually, because uh, we want this marathon to be not only a moment for clarification, but also a moment for revivification and um, making um, all of us uh, understand the uh, uh, importance of working together uh, towards this common goal, which uh, I think goes quite uh, beyond the idea of simply simply uh, finding one million signatures for this uh, European citizen initiatives, but really wants to uh, draw the attention on what you can do uh, to uh, make sure that uh, climate is, uh, is governed and that uh, this uh, deregulation of uh, our everyday life uh, would uh, stop and um, the, all the means are put where they should be, that is to say, uh, to uh, stop emissions and to uh, completely change our economic, uh, our economic priorities and our way of consuming, etc. So uh, we have to consider this day as a moment to um, see our, uh, our initiative in the framework of uh, all of those which are already happening, um, but also as a way to motivate ourselves, because whether we like it or we don't like it, we are not on track. In this moment, we are not doing uh, everything that is needed, um, both at the level of the emission reduction, at the level of the behaviors of, uh, uh, of individuals, and at the level also of what industry uh, priorities um, can be and what also agricultural and other sectors uh, priorities should be. So with the idea that we are not on track, um, the uh, question of where to put resources and where to um, impose a price becomes absolutely crucial and uh, this is really the core of our campaign. So this is not at all something that we only do to get carbon pricing, but also to make sure that the money goes to the right initiatives, that is to say to stop um, emissions by um, changing our energy system, by making our houses much more efficient and possibly passive, by reducing very much the um, uh, air pollution and in general to change the world. So I think that uh, we have really to see this initiative as a part of this huge 
Green Revolution. And I hope that uh, you will enjoy these days. I will have the chance of speaking later on, so I will not make it too long. And once again, welcome, benvenuti, benvenute um, in, uh, to, to this uh, first and probably not last uh, climate marathon. Thank you, Monica Frassoni. I invite everyone who is following to share this live stream uh, with all your channels, friends, uh, using the hashtag HeyYouTaxio2. You can even tag your prime minister if you want to kind of uh, touch the nerve of the national member states. Talking about uh, touching the nerves, uh, Marco Cappato, why we are here today? Today is the 23rd of September. Well, I think that the, the, the starting idea was uh, from uh, the 27 Nobel laureates uh, who uh, launched an appeal and then was uh, signed by thousands and thousands of researchers and academics around the world. Uh, and they, was, they were saying um, a, a quite simple thing and I don't think that is a simplistic thing. The simple thing is, uh, let's use the market. Let's use uh, uh, prices, uh, the economy, uh, in order to uh, stop uh, climate change and uh, to uh, curb the emissions. Let's give a price, an adequate, appropriate price uh, to carbon. And... Uh, Let's use that money to uh, lower uh, as much as possible uh, taxes, for example, from uh, uh, labor. Uh, and uh, uh, this very simple idea is uh, politically difficult because uh, if we are talking about taxes, of course, uh, politicians are afraid. They don't feel themselves strong enough to say yes. Uh, we could tax this, but in order to lower taxes on that. Uh, why they are not confident from that point of view? Uh, because uh, they feel people don't trust them. And this could maybe be true. This is why we need another actor in the scene. We need citizens. Because scientists and politicians are not enough to find a solution. What could uh, be understood as a, a scientifically solid solution, uh, find on the other way, on the other aspect, a, a, a weak political will, a weak uh, um, political institution to uh, transform it in politics. This is why we need the citizens, and uh, we had this uh, idea of launching a European citizen initiative. Uh, we don't have much time left uh, anymore. Uh, we are only at uh, 40,000 uh, signatures on that proposal, but I think we have moved something. We have moved, we have created uh, a civic pan-European movement with a political goal. Because it is not enough to say we have to stop CO2 emission. We have to say how we want to stop it. And this is not just about the environment. This is not just about climate. This is about democracy. Xi Jinping has just addressed the United Nations General Assembly setting the goal of uh, a carbon-free China by uh, 2060. Um, how the Chinese regime will uh, achieve that target. We don't know. We know that a, a, a big and important democracy as the United States is not at all considering this as a political goal. So we have a problem. We need, and Europe is the only continent that can do that. We have to combine democratic methods, the respect for workers, for uh, poor people, to uh, environment and uh, the uh, CO2 carbon, um, carbon CO2 emission goal. Uh, so 
the day of today, the marathon of today is very important because we are trying, and thank you, uh, Virginia, and uh, all the people that worked uh, to make this possible, we have invited uh, all the people in the game, scientists, politicians, influencers and testimonials, uh, people experts on the technical solution on carbon pricing. And this is really an occasion to discuss concrete solution to the problem that everybody is agreeing is a major problem for the next decades, more than the coronavirus crisis, but still it is lacking of uh, a concrete political tools to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you, Marco Cappato. Uh, we have Avi Candeli, who is the creative director of Stop Global Warming .eu campaign. Uh, and he really worked hard to make the message uh, uh, something that can inspire individual citizens as a, as a concrete action that we can all do. Today we are calling for Hey You Tax CO2. So I will ask Avi to uh, bring us a bit into the atmosphere of, of the campaign. What inspired you to put uh, uh, your energies and skills into the creation of uh, uh, this green wave that we are trying to move across Europe? Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, humans. Uh, what inspired me, I must admit, has been the message of Greta and the message of Earth. Uh, and uh, the fact that uh, uh, for our own well-being, we need uh, the survival of, uh, of the web of life on the planet. And global warming is seriously harming with consequences that we are um, very uncomfortable to understand, but uh, uh, what scientists see and say is that uh, we are going wrong. Um, I really liked the, the political proposal inspired by the 27 Nobel laureates because uh, I believe uh, it suggests a way that uh, uh, politics uh, should follow uh, because it, it doesn't want to destroy our industries, our economies. Uh, it just suggests to transform it, evolve it, and uh, when we started, there was not the coronavirus around, but the recovery found, uh, I believe, uh, is, uh, is an add to the initiative. If uh, the European leaders, European Union, uh, consider this proposal and consider the idea to tax CO2 instead of other things that maybe are not so bad for, uh, for life, as work, for instance, um, European Union could serve us in a better way than uh, what is doing uh, today right now. Uh, I don't believe in the fight between ecology and economy because I think that uh, uh, mankind would let win economy. I believe in a, a collaboration between ecology and economy and thanks to uh, the technology, the competence, uh, the, the skills, the networking, we have today the solution to change, uh, uh, to change our economy. Marco just remembered the China initiative. Yesterday, Airbus uh, uh, said that for 2030, they could uh, have uh, hydrogen uh, airplanes. So things can go on. Uh, I would just like to share with you some consideration also about the fact uh, uh, why is it so important to, um, to do something. At the beginning of the 20th century, we were 1.7 billion people. Um, today, we are almost 7, 8, 7.8 7 billion people, and uh, we, we, we multiplied, and... Uh, we are nice, but we have also every each one of us have a carbon footprint, and each one of us today have a carbon footprint ten thousand times what our ancestor had. Uh, I think about uh, mankind one thousand years ago. So, in a couple of centuries, we have just developed in a wonderful way, uh, in a very nice way, but not so sustainable for the planet. Global warming affects us; will affects uh, is affecting people. We are talking about uh, um, climate uh, migrants and um, probably millions of people will need to change their lives and change the, where they live because of the, the global warming. 
but also climate change affects uh, uh, i was talking about the web of life uh, uh, affects for instance insects uh, everybody knows that if bees uh, will disappear our food supply will not last any longer um, if all the worms disappear, for instance, it seems that life science says that in eight months uh, there will be no life anymore on the planet. If all insects disappear in three, four years, uh, there will be no more life. Of course, if mankind disappear, the world will flourish. But uh, as a human, I will defend uh, our existence uh, just uh, uh, thinking about uh, we have to do the right things. Uh, each one of us can do the right thing and change uh, their life, but I don't believe uh, that we can court a human inspiration for a better life, a better, more comfortable life. I believe that we must help, help the people to do the best choice for themselves and also for the world. And I think that's the role of politics. Um, if, if politics don't do it, if politics don't help, don't help us, uh, probably nature will... Uh, act uh, in a much more suffering way, as uh, science uh, suggests and uh, Greta remember. Um, so I think that, uh, I think, I, I believe it's very uncomfortable what we're talking about today. At the same time, so it's the role of, the polit of politics to look at the consequence of the choices uh, we have done or we're doing today, and they should enjoy the power they have to help us and help us uh, the world. Let's not forget that when we talk about the environment, when we talk about uh, the planet Earth, we are talking about uh, the air we, we breathe, uh, the water we drink. It's, we are talking about us. Um, the world, uh, our life is connected to the world. So I think that politics sh should uh, uh, listen us uh, and the citizens uh, aware of initiative should uh, um, sign the proposal and also sustain the campaign because I don't see so many other things uh, so clear and so powerful uh, that can be done uh, in a couple of minutes uh, from home or in a some uh, politician uh, summit. Thank you very much. Okay, sorry, I was muted. Okay, so we put some perspective on the table, but now it's time to connect the dots and move to science because uh i mean we're not talking about theories feelings emotions but we're really talking about facts on the ground or facts in the air to be more appropriate and uh, to do that we have uh, all uh, sorry ornaldo gergi i hope i pronounced the surname correctly um thanks ornaldo ornaldo is uh, um policy and data analyst at Osservatorio Balcani Caucaso Trans Europa. And, um, and he's gonna share with us, uh, uh, is the author of an upcoming and ex exclusive study on CO2 emission in the European Union. Uh, so he's gonna walk us through some of the key findings of this study that the Osservatorio and himself did uh, uh, in cooperation with StopGlobalWarming.eu. Um, so, through this data, we will then open up the floor to Professor Alberto Maiocchi and Professor Imma Zarzoso for some uh, consideration from an economic and scientific perspective on the relationship between uh, CO2 emissions and what can be concretely do. So the floor is for Ronaldo for uh, uh, sharing this uh, uh, study that is almost ready to be make it make public. Uh, so if you have friends uh, that have fan of data numbers, that's a good time to tag them in the comments and invite them to follow this part of the live marathon. Ronaldo. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, everyone, for having me. And uh, as Virginia said, I work for Osservatorio Balcani Caucus and uh, Trans Europa. And just to give a bit more of context in that, uh, we are part of the European Data Journalist Network, which is a network of European newsrooms uh, that has the core mission to inform about European affairs, uh, relying uh, on data-driven approaches and uh, on data journalism. So I will share my screen because uh, most of the data I'm going to show you needs to be visualized to have uh, a better grasp on uh, what they mean. Okay. 
So I will focus in the anthropogenic carbon emission, especially for when it comes uh, uh, for the energy sector in Europe. Uh, now, the reason why we speak about anthropogenic carbon emissions uh, rather than, uh, than all the carbon emissions is that uh, uh, those are the amounts of CO2 emission that are directly produced by human activities, such as the energy sector, industry, transport, agriculture, uh, so forth and so on. So they've been steadily increasing in the last decades and uh, are considered to be a major driver of climate, of climate change uh, to the point that some propose a new term, which is Anthropocene, which should uh, describe this new geological era in which the activity of humans is uh, so strong and so impactful that uh, they are changing somehow the planet. So to do that, uh, we use some data that actually tries to uh, measure the CO2 emissions in Europe and to link them with the different source uh, of human activity that produce that. So to visualize this data to start with, uh, before describing uh, the main finding can we had uh, by this visualization, I'm just going to give a couple of details, which is that uh, every dot in the map uh, corresponds uh, in uh, a cell grid, uh, which is approximately seven by seven kilometers, so 49 square kilometers. And for every cell grid, we have a CO2 emission measurement uh, and also what is the source that produces that emission. So. Uh, in this visualization, uh, we can see the distribution of anthropogenic emission in Europe, uh, and the color code is uh, from dark blue when the emissions are uh, up to 0.1 kiloton per cell, and the dark red is uh, 35,000 kiloton or 35 megatons. So, so what we can see here is that uh, clearly these emissions uh, kind of uh, make sense for how we think uh, uh, Europe or geographical space as citizen, we can see uh, major cities, for instance, of course, Moscow stands out, but uh, also major cities in Italy like Rome, Milan, in Spain, we can see Madrid, Paris, in France, but also what we can notice is that, especially in northern Italy, in England and in Central Europe, there is a concentration of these emissions, so far higher than uh, all the other places. And this, also, and this is mainly due to the degree of uh, urbanization and industrialization of these areas. And uh, as I said before, uh, this data set offers the possibility to um, know what source produces these emissions. And if we go to break down these numbers, uh, we can see that uh, the bigger share, 36% of the European emission, uh, uh, have been produced by the energy sector or by the energy production, then follows the industries with the production and the combustion they use to produce goods, the small combustion, like for heating uh, houses, uh, road transport, and then uh, all the others uh, uh, with uh, lesser magnitude, like agriculture, waste management, uh, exploration, production of fossil fuels, product use, product use, and non-road transport. Uh, and this is why I will focus mainly on the energy. Ornado, don't touch the microphone. Don't oh, touch sorry. the microphone. This is why I will mainly focus uh, on the energy sector, given that uh, is the sector with the relative majority of emission. And to do that, uh, I will try to propose the same visual visualization of before, but making uh, all the measurements that are not related to energy sector transparent and those related to the energy sector in bold uh, to see how they are distributed across Europe. Uh, and doing that, we can see that uh, First of all, there are not many data points related to uh, the energy sector, even though it's the sector that produces the highest amount of CO2. And uh, furthermore, besides some concentration in Central Europe uh, and maybe a bit in Northern Italy, we can see that in other countries they are quite scattered. If we zoom a bit on Central Europe, we can clearly see what is the state of play in Germany, Poland, and Czech Republic. We can see some cluster in Eastern Germany, for instance, Southern Poland, and in Czechia, close to the border with Poland and to the border with Germany. And uh, all of these data points tend to have the highest possible emission in, this, in the color grade. Um, 
which means that their impact on the environment it's really really high negatively as we could witness from the first visualization and this doesn't happen by chance because uh, if we see how energy is produced in this country the the energy is mainly produced through coal plants in fact if we try to visualize or map the coal plants in europe we can see again those clusters eastern germany Czechia close to the border with Germany and close to the border with Poland and in South Poland together with other uh, coal plants. So the state of play for the energy sector uh, in Europe when it comes especially to coal plants is that nowadays there are 250, 250 active coal plant units operating in Europe. And uh, this is quite a high number. And uh, this is also one of the main drivers of pollution due to, uh, due to the energy sector. Even though in the future, this is gonna change somehow because uh, some coal stations are already planned to be closed, like for instance in Germany, but some other will open. So if we see what will be the future state of play according to the data we have so far, we can see that Germany is set uh, to get rid of uh, coal uh, power plants, uh, whilst at the same time, uh, a few more uh, will be will be built in the European Union, two will be built in the Czech Republic, one in Poland and one in Romania. There are anyways, uh, uh, some of more, many more of them will be built in the Western Balkans, like in Bosnia, Herzegovina and Serbia, and uh, more than 40 new coal plants will be built in Turkey. And uh, this signals uh, uh, what maybe has uh, already been said before by the uh, previous intervention, which is that there are some contradictions, some limits to what has to what the European Union and European countries are doing uh, to actually favor energetic transition and to reduce the dependence on uh, uh, fossil fuels. So, uh, as I said, many countries will keep relying on fossil fuel like coal, many EU countries. Uh, Poland will increase the amount of megawatts we'll produce uh, for coal, and the same will be done for the South Republic. Uh, but also, some will happen in the European Union's neighborhood, and most of those countries are prospective European member states. So, this is something that really needs to be considered. And this happens because for how much the trend is going uh, uh, backwards, there are uh, still a lot of investments and loans that go to fossil fuels. So for instance, private banks, this is the data from a Resource Action Network, which samples 15 uh, European private banks to see how much they invested in coal power. And between 2016 and 2018, uh, they uh, invested uh, almost uh, 15 billion euro in coal power and uh, something more than 10 just for extracting coal, uh, which is, of course, uh, a lot of money. But it's not just the private institution who are investing uh, in coal power, also public institution. It, between 2013 and 2017, the European investment banks, for instance, uh, loaned more than 10 billion to fossil fuel related projects in Europe, but mostly in European Union's member states. And uh, when we go to the neighborhood again, we can see that one of the reasons why many coal plants will be open is because uh, between 2006 and 2012, the Western Balkans received more than 50 billion of lendings for fossil fuel projects and less than 2 billion, 1.68, uh, to strengthen their, to produce energy with renewable sources. Yet something is moving, albeit slowly. Of the 15 banks sampled before to see how the private banks are investing in, uh, coal, in coal, uh, we have to say that 13 out of 15 of those banks uh, are adopting or have already adopted the internal corporate policy that are meant to limit, if not ban, the amount of uh, funding and loans they will give to fossil fuel projects. Uh, more than that, uh, the European Investment Bank recently announced its intention to suspend all the funding for fossil fuel industries by 2021. And uh, this uh, could uh, really mean something because, uh, so, uh, because it's been estimated that this, de this decision should lead to around a trillion euros in investment in renewables, uh, as well as giving a strong signal to the private institution on, some, uh, on something that is changing in the way of financing the energy sector. There are also 
good news, uh, which is uh, about the emission overall. Uh, but these good news, as before, have some limitations, some contradictions. So the European Union reached its target to uh, decrease its emission by 20% uh, uh, by 2020, but it's not on track to meet uh, its 2030 target of minus 40%. Uh, and uh, with the existing measures, uh, uh, we know for sure that is not going to happen. Uh, projecting with additional measures, it, the European Union is going to go close to that, uh, but still not really. These uh, has to be investigated a bit, for, uh, a bit further, in the sense that uh, uh, some policies have been enacted, something is been doing, but as I said, is not enough. Uh, one of the uh, main policies uh, when it comes to CO2 emission is the European Emission Trading System, which is a system that limits the emission from more than 11,000 heavy energy using installations like coal plants and air lines, uh, giving caps to these um, industries to the amount of CO2 they can produce uh, and uh, taxing them, making them pay, they produce more. And these uh, uh, brought, uh, these made the cost of a barrel of CO2 go from five to 25 euros uh, in just a couple of years. Uh, the European trading system is meant to cover 45% of European Union greenhouse gas emission and uh, also, thank you to the ETS, for instance, in the first half of 2019, the EU saw a reduction in coal power by around 20% compared to the same period of 2018. So apparently this policy is working, yet it's not enough. As we saw, there are still a lot of limitation and of course there are other policies that could be enacted, like carbon tax. Now, talking about carbon tax in Europe, uh, it's a bit complicated. There are. It, it's many years that uh, in European, in, in Europe, uh, there is a discussion on carbon tax. Uh, but as we can see, some countries already have a carbon tax. The countries brew have a carbon tax uh, in already implemented. Uh, yet there are many difference, differences. To start with, they've been implemented in very different periods of time, like early 90s for Scandinavia or Poland and just 2014, for instance, for France and Spain. But more than that, these taxes are not harmonized, which brings to how much they price a ton of CO2 and what share of the CO2 market they cover. For instance, we see there, there is a lot of variance. Poland taxes a ton of CO2, just seven euro cent, whilst Sweden, 112 euros. And uh, this discrepancy, of course, is also due to the cost uh, of life, but the discrepancy are so big uh, uh, that this cannot be neglected. And when it comes to the share of market they cover, we can see, for instance, that Spain or Estonia has a very, very low share of market. Uh, Spain, for instance, is around 3%, because there are still lots of uh, exemptions, uh, lots of limitations to this application. Mm, the sector that is mainly uh, successfully tasked by the existing carbon taxes is uh, transportation, but still there's a lot that has to be done because, uh, as you can see, it's not really enough in the projection of future CO2 emissions uh, and also in uh, the dysfunctionality this point, that these policies may have uh, in implementation. Now, to actually and hopefully implement a carbon tax in Europe, uh, we can uh, hopefully rely on the active role that you that you commission is having lately, especially. Climate action uh, is, has been said to be a guideline uh, for uh, von der Leyen European Commission from its very inception, from its opening speech, uh, and uh, the Green New Deal on work with a dedicated commissioner. But also, it's good to see how this commission stresses that the energetic transition can be an opportunity and not just a challenge. Of course, it will be challenging, but there's something we, beside the energetic, energetic transition per se, that uh, we can uh, harness, obtain, like uh, living uh, more sustain, uh, in a more sustainable way, lowering our footprints. Uh, and uh, hopefully the EU Commission is meeting a civil society demand for um, a greener Europe, uh, both uh, from uh, stakeholders of the civil society's professional scorers, like in this very event we're here today, or let's say common people, and I think about the Fridays for Future initiative uh, and all those social movement and all those activities that have been organized in order to support these policies and 
this direction of policies and the energetic transition and lowering of CO2 emissions. Yet uh, there may be some issues for the Commission as well, because uh, the fact that uh, the European Commission crafts a policy doesn't mean that that policy will be fully implemented and accepted. For instance, as of June of 2020, uh, there are there is more than a thousand of pending infringement procedure and uh, the environment is the policy area that has more pending infringement procedure. This is not just because of, let's say, a refractory state of mind of member state, but also because environment is very difficult to regulate in the sense that uh, these dispositions are difficult to uh, get translated in the member state uh, law. And, um, Yet uh, in 2019 and 2020 also, environmental uh, uh, infringement procedure had been raising again, and it has also had to be signaled like uh, one of the latest uh, very important policies that uh, the European Union implemented, which is the Directive for 410 by 2018 of the European Parliament and the Council, which uh, has the will to, which is willing to enhance cost-effective emissions and reduction and low carbon investments. Uh, yet this law uh, that this directive has been approved uh, in 2018, uh, a year later in November 2019, uh, 19 different uh, uh, infringement procedure case has been opened because 19 of 20 ADU member states uh, failed to comply with the law. So we need uh, for the European Union to be more um, propositive and to also to listen to the demands of civil society and also to be careful to craft these policies in a way that they can be fully implemented and that the impact can be seen soon enough given that uh, as we unfortunately know time is running out and climate change is happening and the containment measures uh, needs to be strong and resolute uh, and this is something that commission should really look out uh, in order to tax CO2 and uh, to improve the European environment, quality of life and uh, energy sector. So this is all, um, I thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Arnaldo, because you open up the space also for the debate and I'm starting to anticipate the program of the day. Uh, at 2 p.m. we will have a session titled The Advocates of Carbon Market, uh, where we will see how organizations and your movements uh, uh, from different corners of Europe are basically trying to transform in reality. What so all the regulation and rules uh, that needs to happen uh, to make sure that we, we tackle the climate emergency in the most appropriate way and potentially all together as well. Uh, now I open the, um, the floor to Professor Alberto Maiocchi and Professor Imma Zarzoso, who uh, I'm pretty sure they have some uh, um, interesting insights on what we have just seen and the economical, but not only, aspects of carbon pricing policy. I would say, ladies first, uh, uh, if Alberto is agreeing with me, uh, Professor Ima Zarzoso is uh, already participated in an event organized by um, Stop Global Warming. She's professor at University of Göttingen in Germany and University of Haume Primero, Castellón. Uh, so welcome and uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Only to, to say that my surname is Martinez, Martinez Zarzoso. So we use usually the first surname in Spain, Martinez, but uh, thank you very much in any case. So I, it was very informative, the talk by Ornaldo and also the, the, introduc the introduction. And uh, I think you, you have already heard about uh, what is the state of the art of the uh, CO2 emissions in the European Union. And also we have seen the uh, implementation of carbon taxes by single countries. And what I'm going to, to talk then, uh, since a lot has been said already, I will focus on uh, a bit of the academic research that has been done in relation to the success or not in the reduction <coughs> of CO2 emissions and the current European Union policies. So first of all, we know all about the European Green uh, Deal and also other initiatives more related to the agricultural sector, like the farm to fork 
policy, also to reduce the, the use of pesticides and change to more environmental friendly practices in agriculture, and also all the uh, climate initiatives in order to try to reduce emissions with, uh, well, 20, in 2030 and to become car carbon neutral in 2050. So what does the academic uh, research shows about the initiatives that have been already taken? If we talk about global initiatives, maybe to mention the Kyoto Protocol, in which I, I also participate in some investigations. As you know, the Kyoto Protocol and now the Paris Agreement with the Kyoto, the main problem is that very few countries actively participated. However, the research shows that the uh, countries that uh, signed the Kyoto uh, for those countries, reductions were achieved around 7% with respect to the baseline year uh, of 1990. So there was a partial success, of course, of this Kyoto, but the problem was non-participation uh, <coughs> or be, of very, very important players in the, in the world, like the US or China, for example. So therefore, the multilateral environmental agreements uh, have been not very successful until now, but the European Union is playing a, um, a, a very important role and should be also acting as a leader in the world economy and going to the CO2 taxes. Actually, the implementation has been more successful in the Nordic countries, in particular in Denmark, Finland, Sweden, and Netherlands, and also in Norway, that is not a member of the European Un Union, but is also part of the European uh, economic area. And in those countries, they implemented uh, the, the taxes earlier and also at a higher uh, level than other countries, as for example, Spain or Poland. So therefore, uh, what I can say is that the economic research, uh, already published research, trying to see the effectiveness of those taxes is that, yes, especially for Finland, it shows a significant uh, reduction of, of emissions. For the others, uh, they're still early to, to evaluate if, if this has been successful or not. But the main problem is that uh, if we measure uh, emissions in production, we are not doing exactly the right thing. We should measure emissions in consumption. What does it mean? We are importing a lot from many other countries like China and other, uh, other um, new industrialized countries or developing countries. And the thing is that in those countries, they uh, produce uh, in a way that is uh, they use more intensively energy and therefore production is dirtier than in comparison to the European Union. However, here or in the US, we are consuming a lot of production from those countries and therefore what we should measure is uh, emissions in consumption and not in production. And of course, uh, there is a, a lot of issues concerning how to calculate what are the emissions embodied in consumption. And for this, we need to also uh, work with exports and imports and try to find out how to tax those, uh, well, how to tax consumption and also how to achieve taxes that are not regressive. What does it mean regressive? It means that it could be that we are taxing more poor households or poor families than rich families. And therefore, also some compensation strategies are, are needed in order to make those uh, harmon harmonized carbon taxes uh, well um, suitable for the population and also not to increase inequality. So uh, the distributional effects of the taxes is another topic that has been studied also in academia. And since some, some of those taxes could be regressive because uh, in comparison, poor families, uh, a higher share of their uh, monthly income is spent in, for example, transportation than if we compare them with very rich uh, families. So therefore, there is the need to compensate these poor families or these uh, middle income families in order to achieve implementation of this harmonization of the carbon taxes. You all see the, also the protests in France, for example, after they wanted to, to implement uh, such uh, carbon tax and therefore to avoid this uh, negative or detrimental distributional effects, some complementary uh, actions have to be taken at the local, regional and also national level. And summarizing, I would like to say that I think it's very important to, to take actions and uh, very, very soon to stop uh, global warming. One of them is definitely a carbon tax, and it should be good to have one harmonized for the whole European Union. 
but we need also to um, establish some sort of a border tax or complement in order to avoid that production therefore move to countries that have lax environmental regulations and compete with the European Union unfairly in those uh, in those environmental terms. And I think this is mostly what I wanted to, to say. And also another initiative that has to be um, also uh, well uh, put forward is the reduction of the use of pesticides in agriculture, or at least to change to more uh, active substances that are more natural, and therefore we don't contamine also uh, the soil and uh, will affect biodiversity and also uh, well produce more emissions that come from from an important sector that is agricultural sector. Thank you very much. We cannot hear you. Sorry, I, here I am. Thank you, Professor Valzozo uh, Martinez, if I correct. Uh, you mentioned a couple of topics that are dear to Alberto Maiocchi, one of which is the element of uh, uh, economic and social justice included in the Stop Global Warming EU proposal. Uh, Professor Alberto Maiocchi is the scientific lead who worked on the proposal in itself of this European citizen initiative, which I want to remember to everyone that is listening, it needs one million signatures of European citizens to be officially uh, presented to the European Commission. So today we are uh, bringing the topic of carbon pricing in the European public sphere, and we can do this more if the people that are following this live stream are going to share it and maybe trigger some debate with their communities, but there is also an element of uh, doing something which is going and sign uh, on Stop Global Warming EU, the initiative. Uh, Professor Maiocchi, uh, you are going to close this first round, which then is going to be followed by uh, the political intervention of uh, uh, Emma Bonino, Flavia Pansieri, Eleonora Evi, uh, and um, um, Pierre Larotourou, and the other MEPs and MPs uh, and politicians. So help us to close and wrap up uh, the, uh, the debate that we had this morning. Okay. Hi. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Thank you to everybody. I will try to sketch up some uh, of the scenarios that are possible regarding the idea of putting a price of carbon. And uh, it's important, first of all, to stress that we are speaking about a price of carbon. There are different possibilities to put a price, and we should uh, try to envisage what is the best instrument to achieve our goal. And I will start what from what uh, the President of the European Commission has said recently in his State of the Union report to the European Parliament. There are many things important in the speech of uh, Ursula von der Leyen. First of all, the idea that in uh, two, uh, 20... Neutrality shouldn't is very important. There's been the idea that in uh, two, uh, 2030, the rate of carbon emission of uh, 55%. This is important, and also 47% of the financial means of a uh, vote to climate, uh, pro uh, climate change and uh, protection we have of the, the problem with the audio. We have a problem with the audio, so you, Alberto. Maybe, maybe if you yeah. switch off the camera, maybe we hear you better. Yes, okay, okay. Stop camera, okay. So, uh, you hear? Can you hear now? Yes, very well. So, uh, there are many important points in the speech of Ursula von der Leyen. What is the instruments that we need for achieving this goal? There is a reference to the uh, introduction of a border carbon adjustment that is important for uh, the 
from the previous speaker. So it's important about the carbon adjustment, but what are the main instruments to curb CO2 emission? So in the literature, there is a general agreement, as Marco has already said, among economists that the best instrument for curbing CO2 emission is putting a price of carbon. There is a statement uh, from uh, by the uh, American economist, uh, the uh, Europe has also supported this point of view. There are three points that are important regarding carbon price. The first is that increasing the price of carbon of carbon can uh, reinforce behaviors of consumers and producers. You know, uh, we have some problem with the and audio. Alberto, sorry, we have some problem with the audio. Sorry if I interrupt you, but it's worse if uh, we let you talk uh, okay. without uh, people understanding very well what you are saying. Uh, I don't know if sorry. there is. The possibility for you to Nobody. to have a better connection or to go out and uh, also connect. now if I'm I don't know I don't know normally there is no problem with my PC so you don't understand now 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 yes. it seems now yes maybe it's the microphone I don't know I don't know. So I can go on and then you stop me if you, uh, there are different okay. uh, difficulties. So the second energy saving is one point. The second point is fuel switching, putting a price of carbon, uh, reinforce the possibility or the advantage of using renewables. But there is another point that is important. With uh, carbon pricing, we uh, collect a lot of money collect a lot of money. So if we generalize uh, the price, now we have only uh, about 45% of emission are included in the emission trading system. And the price in these sectors is more or less 25 euro per ton of CO2. If we put a price to... Uh, if you increase the price to 50 euro per ton of CO2, in this area we can get uh, an amount of money that uh, can that is, uh, I think, billion euro in the emission trading scheme. If we cover not included in the ETS, so we can get other 110 billion euros. So more or less 200 billion euros can be putting a price of carbon. What are the best use of this money? First of all, as has been already said, a fiscal reform. A fiscal reform means that we have to shift the burden of taxation away from labor use of natural resources. A second use of this money uh, could be to support the production of renewables with investments, technological efforts, innovation, and so on. Another important uh, issue is uh, the problem of just transition. Using the money to be sure that the uh, pricing is not regressive from a, a and also from a regional point of view. So if a country like Poland has to move from coal use to the use of renewables, there should be some support through European money. So I think important elements for uh, in a, strategy of carbon. But I, I, I conclude on another point. So I've said that the most important point is to uh, choose the best for carbon emission in the next years. And if... Alberto, we have a problem 
Albert, we have problem Sorry. again. Sorry, I don't know. Uh, probably I can stop here. Sorry. Thank you, Professor Maiocchi, and uh, we will make sure that, I mean, uh, we will have other opportunities to deep dive. I'm sorry that technology okay, okay. is not always on our side, but uh, okay. th thanks a lot. Sorry. So, okay. thanks to everybody. Thank you, Alberto, and also thanks to Professor Imma, uh, Martina Zarzoso, uh, Orlando Gergi, uh, and Monica and Marco will stay with us, and Davi Candeli. Uh, so we had this first round of the Hey You um, Taxi or Two Marathon Day, uh, and now we are moving to the hot topic of the day, in my opinion, because uh, uh, we will see how politics uh, can uh, is trying to implement carbon pricing policy, what is preventing European institutions, nation states uh, uh, to do that, so what we can do ultimately to make this happen. But also we will try to, to cover the spectrum of uh, local policies, national na local politics, national politics, European politics and global politics. Uh, so we will do a one hour of uh, uh, perspective with some very interesting speaker that I really welcome today. So together with Marco Cappato and Monica, who will stay with us, we have uh, Emma Bonino, a former EU Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid in the European Union and Italian Senator with Pio Europa Radicali. We have Eleonora Evi, member of the European Parliament with Movimento Cinque Stelle and the first uh, European uh, MEP who publicly, and not only publicly, but also with a lot of effort, is supporting uh, StopGlobalWarming.eu. Uh, we have Flavia Pansieri, former UN Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights. So uh, I guess she will bring us into the global side of the story. Uh, Jürgen Klute, former MEP and Managing Director of Europa Blog, Francesco Baldi, researcher at Enea and member of Volt, and uh, this is a tough one, Verduchit, Chris, uh, Chris Verduchit, a member of the Belgian Parliament, and we also have uh, Pierre Larotourou, which is a uh, MEP and also EU rapporteur, uh, rapporteur for the EU budget 2021. So it's really an important group of uh, uh, people that are going to give us some perspectives. So the first on stage is Emma Bonino, Welcome, Emma. Uh, I know it's been busy days after the Italian uh, uh, elections and the referendum, but I hope that uh, talking about uh, how to fight climate change can bring some uh, uh, energy and you will give us some perspective. Both. Well, uh, thank you for this initiative and thank you, everybody. I do apologize since the beginning if I will be with you very shortly. Uh, in the sense that exactly uh, in a few moments, uh, Minister Amendola will explain to us in the Senate how they plan to use the Italian side of the next generation EU, uh, one of the pillars being the, the green future, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for the moment, of course, uh, and of, I imagine you have read the um, State of the Union speech of uh, President Ursula von der Leyen uh, that remains, in my opinion, quite vague uh, uh, in uh, the program. The pillars are clear, but uh, again, then it's up to member states to implement their own priority. One of the pillars is, of course, uh, uh, sustainable development and she uh, committed to allocate uh, to green evolution generally speaking uh, 37 billion euro uh, or uh, something like that i uh, do apologize because i didn't have in this past day the time to carefully read the uh, uh, president van der leyen uh, speech but I think that Minister Amendola will be more um, clear uh, in the hearing he will have in a few moments. Um, I don't have, of course, to explain to you what is uh, uh, the, the, the carbon pricing uh, initiative or the people who are connected, who are, I imagine, 
uh, much more uh, expert than myself. Uh, but from the political point of view, what I do realize, even when I go to the university for conference, etc., etc., that uh, it's very difficult to communicate the carbon pricing. We know that it is the implementation of the polluter pays principle for greenhouse gases, uh, usually in the form of either a carbon tax or a requirement to purchase uh, permits to pollute, commonly referred to as a cap and trade or emission trading scheme. We know that there are differences between the two, but let me tell you that uh, even uh, in environments who are very green oriented and et cetera, et cetera, uh, ex uh, explain uh, the carbon uh, pricing um, is not so easy, not so easy. And this is one of the first obstacles that I see in this, uh, 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 in this campaign. Um, in the environment of experts, everybody knows what we are talking about and the difference between the two possibilities. But generally speaking, we, I do believe that to be successful, we have to find a way to be more easy uh, to use a language uh, easily understandable to people, which is not the case up to now. I do not have suggestions, but uh, believe me, this is a real obstacle. If you just go, I'm not saying, uh, but even if you go to university, uh, it's not so easy to be understood. Uh, it's an idea born by 27 Nobel Prize winners, believe this, I know. Uh, and the second the problem, the problem that I see is the, uh, that follows the first problem I mentioned, uh, is the difficulty to collect signatures. Um, maybe I am a little bit burnt uh, by the experience I had with another citizen initiative on foreigners and immigration, the initiative was called uh, uh, Welcoming Europe. Um, but even if the, the starting network were, was very extended and, um, uh, uh, and um, very uh, well, many, many NGOs everywhere, very important, all over Europe and et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, uh, only uh, uh, the Italian network and maybe another one uh, reached the, plat the platform or the, the reached the, the, sorry, uh, reached the, the number that we are required to set. Uh, state by state. I don't know at what point you are in your website. I saw that you are uh, 41,000. Uh, of course, the number requested is 1 million. And I don't know how you are in the, uh, in the other member states. Uh, even if the signature can be, of course, uh, made through mail, etc., etc., it's not so easy to convince people uh, to to put to get into the website and, and put the signature. So I think that the, we have you have to to uh, and I see if you Europa is committed to this uh, the issue, but uh, the point uh, is that it's not easily uh, uh, is easy to be communicated and to give people the willingness to go and sign this petition. And this is a problem you have to face um, because I think it's the real ob obstacles. Uh, finally, the, uh, how um, somebody asked me to uh, explain better how this money, the, the next generation EU, uh, will be spent. Um, the Commission repeated, and uh, there is now going on another press conference of President van der Leyen, 
on uh, on another uh, uh, issue, which is uh, migrants, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which I will follow. Um, but the the main problem, the main problem, the scheme uh, is that there are three pillars uh, in the new generation. One is uh, uh, green sustainability, sustainability and development. The second is the social sustainability and development, and so health, uh, mm, uh, uh, instruction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and the third is the digitalization. But then, having set this green pillar, uh, it's up to member states to implement at national level and present projects which are coherent with these three pillars, with projects that are coming from each member state. The Commission and then the Council will have a, a, a possibility and uh, the duty in some way, quote unquote, to monitor how this uh, money is uh, uh, will be spent uh, and also the possibility to uh, stop at a certain point if the projects are not implemented uh, in the right direction and the right uh, timing. All this has still to be worked out. And even if we go without too many obstacles at the national or European level, the first part uh, of this uh, uh, new generation will start running uh, not before June. Before that, every member state has to make its project program. Then the Commission has uh, eight weeks uh, to uh, green to give a green light or not. And then the Council has four weeks to agree or disagree with this project. So you see, the, the process is uh, quite uh, complex, uh, which is understandable for such an enormous amount of uh, money. And you can be sure that many member states will be very, very accurate uh, in following the, the, the different uh, dimensions. So for the moment, we have an, an allocation of funds uh, proposed by the, uh, President van der Leyen. Uh, and every member state is prepare, preparing uh, his own real uh, pro projects uh, uh, to be sent to Brussels. Um, by October, for instance, 15 of October, uh, Italy will send the, not exactly the project, but uh, the major line of intervention. Uh, it will be a very difficult mediation. I speak of my country that I know better, but I imagine it will be difficult also because everybody wants a piece of this uh, uh, pie. Uh, and the government should have also the capacity of saying some no, which is not exactly something to which we are accustomed to do. Uh, finally, and it's up to you, I don't know what you have in mind to reach the one million uh, uh, signatures, um, and I don't have good advice to say. I would have done it uh, uh, and made it uh, with the previous citizen initiative on uh, migration, uh, and we couldn't do it, and we were unable to reach. But I hope you will be uh, much more successful of what uh, we, uh, we have been. But uh, remember, it's very difficult to communicate. This is my experience. Maybe you have a completely different experience. But it's such a technical issue apart from the title. The title, everybody can agree. But if you go to the subtitle, the technical issue comes uh, uh, to the floor. Uh, and it's not easy to, to, um, to communicate. This is what I'm saying. So it's the title is easy, 
the subtitles are much more complicated. Thank you very much. If I have any news from the Commission or uh, how they want to go a little bit deep in explaining how they want to use it, but believe me, it will not be the case, the responsibility will be to every single member state. Ciao. Good luck. Thank you. Good Thank luck. you. Thank you, Emma Bonino, for uh, being with us. Ciao, Ciao Marco. Uh, thank you, Emma, for being with us. And we also hope we can rely on your help in spreading the news uh, of the possibility to sign the European Citizen Initiative. One of the things that we are doing as a campaign is to try and empower each person to inform as many people as possible. On the other side, of course, there is a a problem in participatory democracy knowledge for citizens but today we the, the ultimate goal of today is to try and put together as many actors as possible with a clear call on the uh, taxing co2 as a way to uh, reduce emissions so the marathon that we have today that you give me the opportunity to remind to the audience is gonna last for the next 10 hours so we are really at the beginning uh, we will see uh, some of the most prominent actors uh, in this uh, in this topic to help and deep dive, see what it means, uh, carbon pricing, uh, how individual people and organization can contribute uh, to this, to what it is firstly a political goal, and of course then the collection of signatures. But thanks for being with us; it's been very important. Uh, thank you. So Emma Bonino has to to leave us, but we have, as I mentioned, a lot of other guests. So unless Monica and Marco have some comments, I think we we go with the flow of the day. Uh, so for uh, reasons of timing, we the next on stage will be um, Francesco Baldi. He's a researcher at uh, INEA and also a member of Vault Europe. And I think his contribution is interesting to this panel because it brings uh, uh, some perspectives from a pan-European political party. And, uh, and I think it can help uh, our speakers to, to get some other elements of what is going on in the different uh, uh, networks at a political level. So Francesco, the floor is yours. Uh, and then we will go to the other speakers. Thank you. And of course, you can in the meantime share the live streaming uh, with your channels and communities uh, before you speak so that uh, we increase the people that are listening to this today. Thank you, Virginia. <clears throat> and thank you for inviting me and uh, inviting me as Volt to uh, this event. Um, and also thank you for the assist that you gave me to start this, uh, my, my short speech. Um, uh, we as Volt, uh, uh, we are uh, this pan-European movement, so we do exist in the whole Europe. And this, I think that this challenge of uh, dealing with climate change is the one that now is important to to tackle at a European level and that basically that cannot be addressed at the national level. Uh, it was very uh, interesting to see the slides uh, and the presentation from uh, Ornaldo. And I think that th those slides, especially the ones that were showing the um, how the CO2 tax uh, and uh, the, in general the CO2 pricing is different all across Europe, uh, I think it is very important. Uh, it showed it showed very well that it can it's something that cannot be addressed at the country based level. We cannot have different countries with different levels of CO two taxes with different exemptions for different industries because we need to address this uh, issue as uh, as Europe. Otherwise, we cannot really achieve the results we want. Also, I think that uh, this the need for a real like uh, com uh, community effort from this perspective is also shown by what happened with the ETS, uh, the emission trading scheme. Uh, the first one, uh, it was, uh, while it was, let's say, still in a test phase, it ended up with very quickly, uh, basically uh, zero price for CO2. And that was also because many countries tried to get as much, as many allowances as possible for their own to, to basically give a, an advantage to their own industry. And that resulted basically in, a, basically in a failure or at least a partial failure of the whole system, at least in its initial form. Um, so from the perspective of Volt is that, of course, this needs to be a European effort and also that it, this needs to be more ambitious. 
Uh, again, we saw in the slides from Ronaldo that the current trend will not allow us to meet the uh, 2040 um, objective for reduction of CO2 emissions. Um, the current goal for the uh, European Commission is to decrease emissions by 2.2% per year uh, concerning the uh, allowances for the, in the within the emission trading scheme. And in our uh, our objective for our our pr proposal as well is to uh, increase this number by 8% because we cannot uh, we cannot think that uh, things will just go right uh, by themselves. We need to push for a change to happen. And I think that uh, if uh, I will spend a very uh, a few minutes to discuss the problem of interaction between the emission trading scheme and the uh, climate uh, and the carbon tax, which is something that has been quickly mentioned by Professor Martinez, and I think it is important. Uh, because on the one hand, the emission trading scheme is very important because it really provides uh, a, fi a fixed and reliable way to reduce emissions. On the other hand, it is not easy to, ex to extend it to all sectors, which is really where this, the carbon tax that uh, this initiative proposes and where, which Vault supports as well will play an important role because it will allow to cover those, all those sectors that are not covered by the emission trading scheme. Also, we believe that the carb fixing a carbon tax will also allow to give some sort of anchorage for uh, the price of uh, mm, the uh, auctions of allowances in the emission trading scheme. Uh, as we have seen uh, before in the slides, the, uh, the, the one of the problems with emission trading scheme so far has been that the price of these uh, allowances has been very volatile. Basically, this led to a carbon price that was very volatile and low, going between zero and 30, uh, I think, euros per ton of CO2 emissions. I think that uh, putting a fixed value on a carbon tax that represents a value that uh, industries can see and they can rely on, and this value will increase over time and then attach, to some extent, the emission trading scheme uh, allowances to this value will help both reducing further emissions and will help do that in a more stable and reliable way in the future. Uh, I will, the last thing I wanted to mention in my, uh, in my short speech is about, uh, is connecting to what uh, Emma Bonino said just right now, uh, at least one of the things that she mentioned, and that is awareness. Awareness of uh, people when it comes to the issue of sustainability. Um, it, we, uh, as uh, like, um, as a party, uh, as a political party, we do have intentions when it comes to, po to policies, like we have intentions on what we plan to do uh, when we will have a chance to influence uh, European and national politics. However, also as a movement, we know that this cannot stop, uh, this cannot be only left at as, a, as a political level. And as Professor Martinez rightly mentioned, she made the example of the Gilets Jaunes in France. Um, they... Um, they had this, what happened is that there, there started to be some sort of uh, uh, carbon tax and people protested because that had a, a huge influence on their lives and they didn't really understand why it was there. So I think that we need really, on the one hand, to make sure that this carbon tax and whatever mean of carbon pricing we introduce does not increase uh, the differences between different uh, uh, parts of society, that it will not impact the life of the poor people even more. And on the other hand, we have to make sure that people understand to the down to the bottom of their heart why we do this, why this is necessary, and why everyone needs to do their share. Uh, in my um, political and also like professional experience, I had the chance to meet people working in uh, industries that are emit like um, big emitters. But on the other hand, these industries they were driven, and they were not driven by regulations; they were driven really by their own conviction that we need to change something, that they needed to change, that they needed to reduce their emissions because it was the right thing to do. And I think that beyond what is needed to do on a political, on a policy level, we really need this attitude. We really need more people that are uh, really um, intend to do this from their own motives. And we just reward them with the, an appropriate uh, set of policies. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco Baldi. Um, 
So we have uh, um, Mr. Chris Verdurecht. Sorry, the beauty of European politics is that uh, with my R, I try to pronounce multiple names. I'm always getting them wrong. <laughs> so um, uh, Chris Verdurecht is a um, member of the federal parliament of Belgium uh, is one of the, we call them in our campaign, the national MEPs uh, who support uh, uh, Stop Global Warming. And we are very happy to have him with us because uh, the connection of this topic, as we have seen so far, is uh, even if we manage to bring the carbon pricing policy to the European level, ultimately it's a responsibility of the national state to, to work on it. So I'm very interested to hear your take on, uh, on the proposal, but also maybe something about Belgium that uh, you think can either inspire or challenge the people that are listening this uh, marathon today. So thanks for being with us and the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, and your, your, your pronunciation of my name was almost uh, very correct. <laughs> um, yes, I, uh, I'm calling you from, from uh, in the Belgian parliament uh, because there's, net, uh, there's just a commission that uh, does this end here. I am a member of a commission of uh, climate and energy in Belgian parliament. Um, yeah, in Belgium, the um, situation now in, in politics is not so easy. I will not explain everything because this marathon will be not uh, long enough, I think. Uh, but you are still forming a national government, um, which I think yesterday we had a we had a discussion with our national minister of uh, of uh, energy. Um, I told her, and, I, and she she agreed that it's very important in these days, in these corona corona days, that we keep the focus on on uh, on uh, the climate uh, problems and the policy uh, around it. So I was very glad that uh, in the European Parliament, uh, in the State of the Union, there was a lot of attention for for the climate. I think that's uh, that's a good thing. Um, for, for me and for, for my party, uh, there are in Belgium uh, two things uh, which are very important if we talk about, uh, yeah, in this case, uh, uh, carbon pricing or taxes, um, uh, because we think we need a, a tax revolution uh, for, to solve uh, uh, two problems. Uh, first, um, very short, in Belgium the taxes on wages are very much too high, so uh, we are very much in favor of um, taxing every income and, and to spread more the taxes uh, with, which come from wages and we even can, can lower them. Otherwise, we need a green tax shift. We really need that. In Belgium, taxes on electricity are very, very high. Um, and for example, not for gas, which is not a good case because uh, we just uh, need to, to promote more electricity to, to make that, uh, make that uh, step to, uh, to an, uh, uh, a, a greener, a greener uh, society. So we, we need a shift. Uh, we can do that in taxes, um, but we can also do it in, in carbon prices. And uh, that's why I support uh, the, the, the proposition about the carbon pricing, because I very much believe that um, we need to build up um, a budget to invest in, in, uh, in social and in green investments, uh, in housing, mobility. And I don't believe you can do that uh, individually alone. It's not possible. Uh, so we need systems to organize uh, this, and I think uh, your uh, proposition, the carbon pricing, is a very good one in in, uh, in that uh, in that case. So that's why I um, I'm I'm here today. I'm I'm glad I could be here for a short time in in your in in your uh, initiative, which I think is very important. And I will uh, in my country I will uh, um, stay and support it uh, for in the next uh, weeks, months, and and later on. Thank you very much, and uh, we have the fortune of being three people based in Belgium, which is me, yourself, and Monica Frassoni that uh, is connected here with us. So maybe we can even come up with some ideas for social distancing, but uh, uh, active actions in Belgium to, to promote the campaign, if you are up for it. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we have connected Eleonora Evi. Eleonora is a member of the European Parliament um, and uh, of Movimento Cinque Stelle, and she's very active on everything that pertains to the environmental issues. She's a member of the MV Committee, so uh, she's in the best position to tell us what is the state of the art and also if you think that what we are doing is important, if you are here, I think you think, uh, how we can push further this, uh, this initiative that merges the citizens' proposal with what it can happen. Uh, and we think all of us, it should happen. So welcome, Eleonora, and uh, the floor is yours.
thank you thank you so much uh, thank you for inviting me uh, it's a pleasure to to be here and to uh, to, to 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 say some words uh, in support of this uh, very very important initiative uh, in general and generally speaking i do always support ecis uh, as i really believe uh, the european citizen initiative as a tool uh, is a an important and powerful tool to make uh, uh, people voice uh, heard at European level and to let citizens uh, uh, influence and uh, be part of the decision uh, uh, taken here at uh, this level. And today, it is more important than ever. And in particular, I'm very much supportive of this ECI, the Stop Global Warming ECI, as it is very timely and really very important because we desperately need a major shift in uh, climate policies and uh, the the proposal made by this ECI is really uh, um, clarifying the way where European uh, policies should be uh, going today um, I, I would like to spend a few words uh, about the uh, the general situation because uh, um, today, in this moment, we at European level, we will be working and the European Commission will be um, working on key decisions that will really uh, have the, 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 the possibility to shape our future and to, uh, to make this transition to uh, zero uh, um, emission, net zero emission uh, continent uh, in, a, in a timely uh, manner. Uh, we do hope so. Um, otherwise, if we lack ambition uh, and we, we could compromise uh, our last chance uh, of halting the current uh, climate crisis, and this would be very, very bad. Uh, so, if, if today we do not set the bar very high uh, and high enough, uh, this will uh, condemn ourselves and the future generation to face this climate ca catastrophe. Uh, and this is why, uh, as I said, this ECI is really important and timely. So, the, what are these key decisions that European institutions are working on? First of all, the 2030 targets the uh, 2030 targets for emission reduction. This is very important. We uh, have in, enshrined in law at the moment a 40% reduction for 2030. This is not enough, simply not enough. A few days ago, the European Commission, President von der Leyen, as you all know, in her State of the Union, uh, speaks about uh, a reduction of at least 55% reduction target for 2030. That's okay, but I wanted to stress the fact that science and the IPCC um, uh, panel were asking for a, a higher reduction. I myself, I tabled amendment in the NB committee to ask for a 65% reduction of, emission tar of emissions, um, of greenhouse gas emissions for 2030. Otherwise, we, we would run the risk not, uh, not uh, um, reaching the climate uh, goals and climate neutrality we are setting uh, at 2050. So that's why the 2030 target, it's uh, a major and important step that has to be ambitious enough in order to uh, give and pave the way for the climate neutrality. Uh, the ENV committee uh, recently voted in, uh, so the, in, the, in the European Parliament, we recently voted um, for a 60% reduction. And this is good because uh, it's higher than the proposal by the European Commission. And I uh, can uh, confirm that this will be the topic of this autumn uh, and the next months uh, where uh, institutions and European ins institutions inside uh, here in the European Parliament and then the European Parliament with the Council and the Commission will be working and the uh, fight will be um, uh, hard uh, and uh, I guess uh, uh, harsh uh, enough. So it will be a heated debate in my opinion and that's why I believe that this ECI is timely and important because it uh, gives the uh, more, many more arguments uh, in order to increase the level of ambition of the 2030 uh, targets. Uh, 
Second, uh, there is another uh, point I want to uh, mention. It has, it has been mentioned also by uh, Francesco Baldi before, which is the uh, ETS system and how we can um, uh, improve uh, the rules that we have today for the ETS uh, uh, scheme, the emission trading scheme. Uh, why? Because the European Commission is planning to work on a revision of the uh, current ETS rule. Uh, which should come into force from 2023, and it's also planning a revision of uh, the energy taxation directive. And the, these two revisions uh, uh, of those two uh, pieces of legislation are highly re relevant for the proposal of the ECI of introducing a floor on the price of CO2 emissions and ending free allowances. And uh, Francesco Valdi explained it very well all the um, um, uh, all the um, major uh, weaknesses that, that we can find in the ATS uh, systems, as I personally believe uh, that uh, it has failed in its main uh, objective of reducing emissions in the industrial sector uh, and the uh, thermoelectric uh, sectors, uh, uh, because basically uh, industries have continued to emitting without any significant incentive uh, to move towards a sustainable production, even though there was a lot of um, uh, talking about that, but in practice, a uh, uh, th few things have been done. So the ridiculous price, uh, and this has been said already, uh, of the CO2 allowances uh, has indeed been too low, too low, simply too low to stimulate investments. So industries uh, prefer to keep paying such small amount of money and continue polluting uh, instead of changing the way they produce. In addition, and this is also a very bad side of all the story, uh, very sad, uh, free allowances give, uh, uh, that has been given left and right uh, have led to a situation where some industries have even made windfall profit, high windfall profit uh, out of this system. And this is simply not acceptable. Um, the third point I want to mention, uh, because I believe it's relevant for the discussion, is the discussion we are having today on new owned resources and the introduction of a carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, for which the Commission is expected to put forward a proposal during the first half of 2021 and should be introduced uh, by at least uh, uh, the 1st January 2023. So we are exactly in the right momentum when this ECI can influence the shaping of these new proposals. Uh, the introduction of a carbon border adjustment, uh, which is part of the request of this proposal of this ECI, uh, could take various shapes uh, an excise uh, duty or, on, or VAT uh, on EU or non uh, EU selected products or a custom duty. Um, and uh, on selected carbon intensive and imported pro products. But whatever the, the, the main message here is that whatever, whatever will be the selected approach, I strongly believe that it should be designed primarily for environmental reasons. And of course, of course, to protect uh, industries that adopt already high environmental standards from unfair international competition. Any other attempt to uh, protect our industries uh, as such, uh, simply as that, won't be acceptable in my opinion. And uh, so protectionist, uh, uh, it could become a protectionist measure disguised as an environmental one. This could not be acceptable. In addition, the resources, and this is also the, the, the nice side of the story, and I will um, go uh, um, uh, rapidly to the end of my uh, intervention, these uh, um, resources that will be obtained by uh, taxing CO2 could represent an important, a very important financial stream to finance the EU budget. And we know uh, how much desperately need today uh, the new budget, new own resources. And the fight here is very um, is very um, heated as well. Uh, so these new tax revenues, as rightly pointed out by the ECI, should be reinvested in reducing income tax on low incomes, promoting energy efficiency, and shift to re in renewable energies. So as you can see, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, good reasons in supporting this ECI, you, as you know better than me. And this is why I really hope that this ECI will reach and uh, uh, overcome the threshold of the 1 million signatures uh, in order to make this proposal of a true carbon pricing at the center of the EU debate. 
we desperately need a major change and a major shift in the way we produce energy, goods, uh, uh, the way we move, the way we, uh, we uh, eat, uh, we, uh, we heat and cool our houses if we want to really to uh, save the planet. And so putting a price on carbon would be a key driver for this shift. Um, I also want to conclude by saying that this ECI is and could be really a strong wake up call for Brussels and for European institutions, as I really believe that many citizens uh, out there are really asking for uh, uh, concrete and real changes and are fed up of greenwashing. So these are concrete measures that has to be put in place as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Eleonora, for your ability to combine always passion and competencies uh, and it's always a pleasure to, ha <laughs> to have you with us and uh, the purpose of today is exactly what you last said is to try to put together as many voices as possible not only as people being here physically with us for 12 hours but also each one of us and the people that will be in the next panels uh, to inform others about what's happening because of course uh, the more we are the merrier will be. Uh, Monica Fassoni has a couple of words to say before leaving us and then we will go to the last three speakers and the conclusion with Marco so uh, yes. bear with us. Thank you. Monica, very very give us briefly I think um, that Eleonora and Chris uh, are certainly um, said exactly what uh, what we what we believe uh, the role also of uh, members of parliament is in this discussion and Emma as well, and I was wondering whether um, it was uh, it could be possible from their side um, to take some kind of uh, initiative of or responsibility uh, to spread the news also uh, in their own assemblies. Um, I think that if we could have uh, some members of parliament that are particularly motivated to uh, give us uh, a hand in this, um, this could be quite interesting. Of course, I did contact my own group, my own former group, uh, the Greens, but um, I believe that if we could have uh, a group of, I don't know, some 10 people that uh, um, could drive this uh, discussion in their own um, assemblies, this could, be, um, this could be really useful. Um, also to uh, create a, some kind of parliamentary support group for the CCI. Uh, of course, CCI is not an institutional initiative itself, but uh, the fact that members of parliament are informed and can spread the news could be uh, indeed, uh, uh, indeed quite useful. And the same thing, of course, goes for uh, local um, elected, uh, locally elected, uh, elected people. It is not always easy. I am trying to do this in my own local council. It's not quite, uh, um, quite, uh, quite a piece of cake. But uh, perhaps over the next weeks we can, we can work. And if Eleonora um, could give us a hand in the, in her parliament and Chris in in his own, uh, perhaps uh, we could uh, we could set up a couple of uh, of actions there. This is what I want to say, and I and I am going to see you later. Thank you, Monica. The later that you are referring to is that 6.30, there, is be the Italian, there will be the Italian session on the same channels. So you, we will meet Monica Frassoni again for that session, and uh, which is going to be after another politician that was, is not with us today, but at 6, uh, Marco Capato will have a one-to-one -one with Yanis Varoufakis. So stay tuned during the day because it's gonna have some surprises uh, on the topic of carbon pricing and more. Uh, okay, thanks Monica Frassoni, thanks Elena, and thanks everyone. We go to the next one. I see, I think Flavia Pansieri, who has been with us since 11.30, uh, so I think she deserves her spot. She's a former, uh, Deputy UN, Deputy High Commissioner. Uh, so she's probably the best person to tell us something about the global impact of carbon pricing and maybe the role of Europe within the grand, great scheme of things that is this thing called the world. So thanks, Flavia, for being with us. <laughs> One second that you are muted. Let's unmute you. Okay. Okay. I'm so, hi everyone and thanks for the invitation. Very happy to be here with you on what is frankly an absolutely not just important but essential initiative for our common future. Um, given my 30 plus years uh, with the UN, 
uh, my remarks will be looking not just as the EU, I am after all an EU citizen, but also at the broader context, which is where uh, my experience, if any, comes from. I've been working in social and economic development, I've been working in gender equality, human rights most recently, but also, and that was a very fascinating experience, learning experience, including for me, uh, as head of the United Nations Volunteers Program, which I see very close to in spirit and activities to what a citizen's initiative is. Um, first of all, I'd like to make a point about the global context. Uh, Fine. Xi Jinping said at the UN they want to become carbon neutral by, what, 2060? Good luck. Uh, that would be wonderful. I see it as a tremendously tall order, given the way the UN, the, the China has been working to support its economic development so far. When I was in China in the mid early 80s, uh, China was investing in solar power, in wind power, in geothermal. That sort of fizzled out as they started to kickstart a big economic development and they went fossil fuel, carbon, nuclear as well. So they will have to perhaps reverse a bit if they want to reach the target. Right now I would give them the benefit of the doubt, but I would want to see that. If we look at the other side, uh, from where Europe is geographically located, I think we can only start crying. We have the US, which has a situation in which not only it isn't committed to any form of environmental action, it is intentionally doing away with safeguards and approaches that would if nothing else, limit the damage. The Environmental Protection Agency has been torn apart, uh, is being staffed at the top with people who are total climate change deniers. I don't need to go on. We know that it is a, a dire situation. We have another big country, just to take a few examples, Brazil, merrily moving in into the Amazon with big investments, deforestation and the like. So what does this mean? That either we throw up our hands in despair or the only entity that really can take a political lead at this point in this essential area is the EU. And I think it's important for the EU to take on this responsibility because others don't quite or don't at all do it. Um, there are concerns at times that, yes, we introduce all these measures, but the other countries don't, and the impact will affect us as well. True. But I am a great believer in the power of example. And I think that once we have a European Union that moves ahead intentionally committed to promote uh, environmental protection, reduction of CO2, uh, fairer redistribution of resources, which is an essential corollary. We, as EU, European Union and citizens, will gain the support of many smaller countries whose voices cannot be heard and who are equally essential in the context of uh, a, glow, a planet that wants to survive. I'm just thinking of, for instance, think the Maldives, the, the peak in the Maldives is 2.4 meter. The average is, is 1. Point, I don't remember, 1.2, 1.3 meters average height. Kiribati in the Pacific is 1.8 meter in average. These are countries that will disappear. Once this happened, because global warming has covered them with water, where will these people go? We will face a situation, not just as one of the previous speakers has spoken of environmental migrants. This will not be migrants. This will be environmental refugees because they have nowhere to go and their livelihood has been... Uh, eliminated the potential for a livelihood there where they had a country which they don't have anymore. So I think the political, the call for political action 
for the EU is extremely strong. And I think it's important that anyone who has uh, a role um, in uh, the context of the European Parliament, in their own national parliaments, has a responsibility, I would say, a duty. There are rights. I was a commissioner, deputy high commissioner for human rights, but I've always been very conscious that there are also important duties that we have to face. And there is a duty there to be the voice for responsibility for, for today and for the future of our children and grandchildren and so on. That being said, there is, it's not enough to delegate to our representatives' action. And I think uh, it's very important, and I've seen it in particular when I was at the United Nations Volunteers Program, how much a difference a citizen's engagement and initiative can make. Um, it's, it's a way of prodding our uh, elected representatives and because they want to be elected again, the prodding, if done consistently and with sufficient numbers, can be very, very effective. So I do believe that uh, in order to ensure that the initiatives goes forward, it's important for the political representatives to feel that it has strong popular support. So the question is, how do we bring about this support? It's a, We are at 40,000 something signatures. How do we get to 1 million? Uh, having had a similar experience at the United Nations Volunteers with a program which was called Volunteering for Our Planet in preparation of the uh, conference of the parties, the COP in Copenhagen, which was supposed to seal the deal and didn't in fact seal anything. Um, I realized that the beginnings are very slow. I'm not yet worried that we are at 40,000. The point is that we are now increasing still at the level uh, arithmetically and we have to come to an exponential growth in numbers. So individual action by any one of us becomes essential. And at that point, I would like to say something. Let's not be shy. I'm becoming a pain with my hairdresser, my butcher, my uh, plumber. And any time I have a contact of whatever sort, I just pick the topic and say, you know, you should do this. These are the details. This is the information. And I see maybe because I live in what is called the green heart of Europe, uh, of Italy, sorry, Umbria, and everyone has a little piece of land or something that they, they do, they, they, they see the impact of climate change. And the individual person is much more uh, responsive emotionally to the issue than I would have expected. So I think we do have a responsibility to use our contacts as well as the extremely powerful social media to which we all more or less are connected to spread the word. There is a moment where the growth of signature will go from um, arithmetic to exponential. It will kick off and then we won't be able to stop it anymore. So. Uh, while I do understand Emma's point about being a bit hesitant about uh, uh, a citizen's initiative that needs to collect one million signature, I remain optimistic that we can get there if we all um, chip in. Um, that being said, I would like also to make a point from, from, from the human rights perspective, because um, what I have seen in the many years and in the many countries that I have gone on mission to is how much people who are already vulnerable in the best of circumstances are even more vulnerable in the context of climate change where they don't have the means to mitigate the ability to adapt. And therefore, uh, um, it's always better to intervene with before the problem uh, exists 
rather than with humanitarian responses afterwards, which are always much more expensive. So I would say that in addition to uh, a real concrete interest in the part of the EU to address the issue within itself, there is also both a moral responsibility to take the lead and become a, 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 a force to inspire others and to take care of supporting those countries, individuals, groups, communities that are affected and very seriously to the point of endangering their right to life by actions that, frankly, they are not responsible for, but we industrialized countries carry the responsibility for. So uh, to conclude these few words, and I'll be happy, I would be happy to give you some examples of, of how I encountered these, these challenges when I was working in the field, both from the human rights, the gender perspective, or more generally in development. But I think the time perhaps would not allow, I would love to talk you, to you about that. I, I'd like to conclude by saying, um, let's make sure that uh, we try to identify those areas where our advocacy can have a multiplier effect. An NMEP with other members of parliament at the national level through social media in order to go beyond the usual suspects, so to speak, and achieve that exponential growth without which we won't reach the one million signatures that are necessary for this absolutely essential initiative to be given the attention that not only it deserves, but it desperately, desperately needs. Thank you very much. You left me speechless. No, thank you very much. It's been uh, super inspiring and uh, super, you are one, I feel you're one of us already. So thank you very much. And I think uh, we will put in the comments all, all, the, all the materials that are available for citizen activists, individuals to get the stopglobalwarming.eu logo going around. We don't have with us the mayor of Palermo, Leo Luca Orlando, but it's worth to mention the important role of cities and local municipalities can play. Palermo is, is the first city in Europe to adopt the stopglobalwarming.eu motion, which commits the municipality also to inform the citizens about their right to sign. The initiative and uh, we are really trying to involve as many mayors in this action because it covers a double meaning one is for the environment and one is about our rights as european citizens to take part in shaping the eu policies so as flavia pansieri said like all of us has a lot of uh, uh, non-violent weapons to be used in this uh, thing that we are trying to do. Um, we are a bit late, but I, th I hope that everyone thinks it was worth to listen to each other. Um, I will give the. I, I would like to conclude with you, Genklute, just because as a former MEP and a student somehow of participatory democracy, I think is the best one to conclude the panel. If for you it's fine, and uh, we have Timote Galvere who is not an MEP yet, but is the policy advisor of uh, um, Pierre Larotour, who we unfortunately cannot be with us. He's busy in Paris for some uh, uh, activities, but uh, um, Pierre and, uh, <coughs> and Timote will share with us some perspectives on the current situation. It's kind of a um, continuation of what we discussed so far. So what's happening in Europe, uh, Timo, and uh, with regards to the targets of CO2 emissions, uh, what is being done, what can be done, and how carbon pricing plays a role in it. One second for your microphone. Try now. Uh, okay. Yes. 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 Now, now it's uh, unmuted. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting no. me and uh, hi to you. Mm, 
as yes, I, I think uh, global warming is any longer a theoretical uh, issue. For a long time, it was a very, uh, especially from, from countries uh, like Middle Europe uh, or North Europe, it was more or less a theoretical question. But uh, meanwhile, you can feel and see the uh, consequences of the global warming in Belgium and in Germany as well. Uh, we have uh, for three years uh, much less rain in Germany and in Belgium than in the years and decades before. We have uh, serious problems uh, with the lack of rain uh, concerning uh, forests, concerning uh, farming and so on. That's, uh, th that's, that's good in that sense that people really feel and see that uh, global warming and climate change uh, is, is, uh, is, is a real fact uh, and uh, they are affected by, by, by it. But on the other side, uh, I, I followed very, um, very closely the debates we had during the last uh, months or one, two years in Germany. On the other hand, uh, we, we have to take into account that a lot of people recognize that a real and an um, effective action against climate change and climate war uh, warming or global warming uh, will have a strong impact of their daily life. And that's a big, a, a big and, and, and serious uh, moment. A lot of people feel that they, that they have to change uh, their consumption, they have uh, to change their mobility, uh, they, they have to, to change a lot of things in, in daily life. And uh, on the other hand, they say, if we will tax and, and price uh, uh, CO2, then mobility uh, uh, will, will get uh, more expensive, uh, warming of our houses will get more expensive. Uh, and, and yes, uh, our, our meat will, uh, our, our um, uh, uh, daily meals will, will uh, get more expensive as well. And especially in Germany, we have a big um, debate on, on, on this uh, issue. And uh, there are some conservative politicians that say there is a, con a contradiction between uh, climate policy and social policy. And I think uh, a, a big, from my point of view, a big challenge for us is to explain that climate policy is not in, in opposition to social policy. Uh, remember what, what Flavia said about the vulnerable people in some parts of the world. I think we, we, we can uh, look to, to, to Europe as well. We, we, uh, as, especially the poor people are the people they will be affected much stronger by, by climate change and, and warming than people, they, they live in better conditions. And therefore, my opinion is, or my conviction is, that a good climate politic, uh, will, a, a policy will be, at the same time, a good social policy. And I think we have to explain this to people, and that could be open the mind for people to get ready to sign this uh, ECI. In Germany, where uh, I, I started recently to, uh, to promote uh, your ECI and the reaction I got by, by a lot of people from Germany is, yeah, but we, 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 we couldn't pay uh, higher, uh, higher costs for mobility, warming and so on. And therefore, I, I think a crucial point is to, to explain how social policy and climate policy policy is connected. That's one point we have to do. And the other point um, is uh, perhaps you, uh, you you know the France started uh, some months ago a climate council. It was a kind of uh, citizen uh, assembly. They invited uh, it uh, by um, they, they, they invited uh, citizens to make proposals how to deal with the climate uh, change and uh, with global warming. And this group, this uh, citizen assembly was built uh, by random. 
uh, you can find a good uh, explanation on, on the on the website uh, of the of the French government. It's in French and uh, in English as well. And they made a lot of um, changes. And I think it's important to involve the citizens because it, it depends on the countries, uh, of course. But in, in Germany, I see, and maybe in Italy, uh, Italy it's, it's uh, from my point of view, very similar. Uh, a lot of people don't trust anymore in, in politicians. And therefore, from my point, uh, it is crucial to involve citizens in finding solution for fighting for fighting uh, uh, global uh, warming and, and climate change and this type uh, the france government uh, started uh, some some months ago uh, to 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 establish the citizen assembly to find uh, or to to table uh, to, to collect and and, and table uh, proposals uh, for fighting uh, climate change seems a good idea to me and uh, we should learn from this and my idea it's, it's a little bit a, a different point but my idea is we we should do everything to to make this uh, eci uh, successful and on the other hand we should propose and encourage the commission if we could make it uh, successful this uh, eci to establish the citizen assembly on european level as well to work on concrete legal proposals uh, concerning the the pricing of uh, carbon of uh, co2 there are already some um, states uh, they tax uh, they, they they started to tax uh, co2 and they developed some interesting models uh, to, to fight uh, uh, social injustice and imbalances. Uh, from, from my point of view, uh, it's, it's uh, easy to do. If, you, uh, if, if, the, if the political will is, uh, is there, then we can find solutions which deal with, uh, with the situation of, uh, of uh, poorer people. And therefore, uh, I'm really in favor with, with this uh, ECI on one hand, but on the other hand, I think we, we have to try to uh, convince uh, the, the um, European Commission uh, to build up in follow up to this uh, ECI, independent whether it will be successful or not, uh, to, to, to establish a kind of citizen assembly on European level. That's, uh, that's, that's my, my very, very important point. And yes, of course, uh, I, I only can can uh, underline uh, what Flavia said. Uh, we have to do everything we can do to make uh, this uh, ECI uh, successful on uh, successful and accept as as stakeholders uh, and to say we we have to be uh, let's say. Uh, um, an ambassador of this uh, idea, an ambassador of this. Uh, um, ECI and ask uh, all people around us uh, to sign it. Okay, that's uh, what I wanted to contribute. Thank you very much. Uh, I think my introduction was a bit messed up. So now we have uh, Timothée Galver for the perspective of uh, Pierre Larotourou. And uh, we are a bit late, but we're going to have also a quick uh, intervention from the Comune di Palermo. I just mentioned them and they're gonna uh, tell us something about their initiative and uh, so probably there won't be a break between this session and the other but um, Timo, welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, perfect. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Timo and I want to start by apologizing on behalf of Pierre Larouturou uh, my MEP, uh, he's unfortunately uh, stuck in Paris, as Virginia said. Um, so Pierre is um, a member of the European Parliament since last year, a member of the uh, Socialist and Democrats group, and a member of the Committee on the Budget. And this year, he's also general rapporteur for the uh, next EU budget, the 2021 budget. So we're really involved with all the current negotiations on the MFF, on the recovery plan. And I'm going to be talking uh, about little bit about this and how carbon pricing can help uh, fuel a more ambitious and greener uh, climate budget. Um, so it's going to be a bit related to uh, what Miss Evie uh, already said because we're also uh, cooperating 
uh, together. So it's going to be a bit similar. But uh, let me start by, by saying that we have currently two problems. Uh, the first problem is a huge green investment gap. Uh, it was estimated at 470 billion euros per year, meaning that to reach our current um, climate and energy objectives, uh, the European Commission estimated that there's a huge uh, green investment gap. So we know that to invest in public transport, in renewables, in renovation of buildings, we need to find a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And that's when uh, carbon pricing can play a role. Uh, the second problem, uh, it's related to the uh, recovery plan. So not only in Europe, we don't put a high enough price on carbon, but we also subsidize, as you know, uh, unfortunately, some fossil projects. Uh, for example, the European Parliament just uh, opened up the possibility for the Just Transition Fund, which is a special fund allocated to uh, fossil intensive areas of the EU that will need extra help uh, for the transition. Well, this fund is now making eligible uh, gas infrastructure projects, natural gas. So uh, we have two main issues. Uh, we don't have enough money uh, for, you know, for, for green investments. And the little money we have, we're not investing it greenly enough. We're, 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 not, uh, we're not doing the things we should do with our recovery plan. We are locking in uh, emissions for many more decades because if you start building uh, airports, if you start building gas, uh, gas-powered electricity generation, we will have locking emissions for many more decades. So we really have to get rid of these uh, brown investments and increase the, 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 our, our volume of green investments. And that's how carbon pricing can help. Um, so we obviously need uh, an exclusion list, meaning that uh, fossil infrastructure projects, energy intensive industries should not be helped by taxpayers' money, uh, especially in what is being called at the EU level, the, the recovery plan, the next generation EU. Uh, you're not investing in the next generation of European. If you're investing in, in airports, if you're investing in gas projects, if you're investing in motorways, that's not, that's something of the, of the old economy, unfortunately. Um, and now, so we, we, we need to make the, the recovery plan much greener, but we also need more money. And that's when carbon pricing can, can play a role. So you can have, uh, uh, Ms. Evie was already talking about the, the introduction of new EU own resources. Um, these, you know, or very often uh, European citizens might think, oh, but we don't want the EU to become, you know, uh, a tax supranational engine. But, you know, there are good and bad taxes. And at the EU level, um, we actually have opportunities to introduce uh, tax justice reforms and also, you know, actual, actual climate action. And by tax justice reforms, I mean, for example, uh, uh, a wealth European tax or a financial transaction tax uh, or a higher uh, profits tax because for now, uh, well, as the Oxfam, um, Oxfam report of last Sunday uh, made clear, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 1%, the top 1% of the world population uh, emits twice as much as the 50 uh, poorest percent of the global population. That's just insane. So. To fix this, uh, not only we need to reduce our, our carbon footprint, obviously, but we also need to make sure that we introduce tax justice reforms to make sure that we reduce inequalities and we also reduce our carbon emissions. So, you know, introducing tax justice reforms such as uh, financial transaction tax, we can bring in over 50 billion euros per year. And that can be done very easily from 2024 as the European Parliament is advocating for can be a way of increasing the EU budget. Uh, another way is to, well, as the as the theme of the of the of the webinar is and of the ECI, obviously, is to tax carbon. And there are two main proposals now. It's the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which the ECI is already uh, advocating for. It's the idea of you know having um, a price on on carb on pricing carbon of imports. So all goods that have a very high uh, carbon footprint, when they enter the EU market, they will be taxed at a, at a certain level. And the idea is to introduce this new mechanism, this new tax, as a new EU-owned resource to make sure that the EU is financed through no longer through national contributions, which make it a bit 
uh, forced to you know uh, uh, to to only rely on on whatever the member states agree on giving to the EU. So it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a great way to to have more European integration because you actually cut the link between national budgets and the EU budget. And for the EU to be you know more autonomous, you you need these new um, own resources. Uh, another kind of own resource we can have is the the revenues of the emission trading system, the EU ETS. It's the the, the, the current carbon market, which we've talked about uh, already. It has many uh, disadvantages, but uh, one way to make it better is not only to increase uh, the, 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 the price of, allo of each allowance, so the price of polluting permits, but also to gather the revenues into the EU budget. So you can make sure that many more industries are covered, such as shipping, such as uh, aviation, and you can increase the, 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 the polluting permits to make sure that, again, the EU has much more money uh, to spend for the financial, for the green transition in renewable public transport, uh, building renovation. Uh, so, yeah, and carbon pricing obviously also has the, 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 the power of uh, dis disencourage consumption of fossil fuels, and that's really something uh, we have to do ASAP. So on, on our review in the in the European Parliament, um, obviously we're trying to push for this uh, for the introduction of these two new own resources as soon as possible. Uh, there's also the the plastic tax that is going to be um, introduced from from next year onwards, uh, from the first of January 2021. But here's my uh, main uh, message for the carbon border adjustment mechanism and for the EU ETS resources for all these new. Uh, new own resources proposals, uh, tax justice reforms, carbon pricing, we need pressure from European citizens. So I really want to encourage you to encourage everyone to, to, sign, the, to sign the ECI, of course, but also to make some more noise in the streets, if you can, on social media, signing an ECI, as you know, uh, it, it's great, but you also need to get involved with initiators. So, you know, send a message to Virginia, and uh, we, we, we really all have to, to fight in the same direction to put pressure on, on uh, European decision makers. And I'm going to stop here. I've talked a lot already. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Timote, to yourself uh, and also to, uh, to Pierre Lagotourou that I know wanted to be with us. So thanks, thanks a lot. So just to give you a bit of a sense, in 15 minutes we have the next panel and we need a bit of technical uh, transition. But Virginia, so I, I um, seized the opportunity to introduce uh, uh, the um, deputy mayor of the city of Palermo uh, so that with my introduction, uh, introduction, I will not uh, make uh, another speech, also because I will have to speak uh, another two or three times during the day. I just want to underline the importance of cities. Uh, also, I'm thanking uh, all the, the speakers of this panel. I, I think it was really precious. But uh, um, um, cities are, of course... Uh, uh, the, the institution close to citizens, and it's very important what happened in Palermo. Uh, Paolo will explain this better than me, but uh, uh, the adhesion from the mayor, but also the vote in the, in the city council, and this is uh, really important because uh, one of the things that could uh, uh, lead us from arithmetic to exponential growth, as Flavia Panzeri was saying, uh, is exactly the, the involvement of uh, local uh, communities. Um, and, and the same time, the, the other thing that I wanted to say is uh, um, uh, addressing to the people that have uh, uh, maybe doubts on the issue of the uh, correlation uh, among uh, um, CO2 emission and climate change and so on. Of course, um, I don't want uh, to open this debate, which is a, a mainly scientific debate, but uh, I think that the shifting, from, the shifting of taxes from uh, emissions 
to labor, from labor to emissions, and from um, uh, all the kind of uh, consumption of uh, environmental uh, goods. Uh, um, this this thing we should do it anyway. I mean, taxes exist anyway. We have to pay them anyway. So uh, we are in an era in which uh, labor is under pressure uh, because of technology, because of artificial intelligence and so on. So uh, we need social policies. And the only way nowadays to finance those social policies is to shift taxes from labor to the consumption of natural resources. This is not just about global warming or climate change. It's a fundamental principle of, uh, uh, of uh, solidarity and uh, uh, transition to new techno technological society. I think uh, this is uh, a very important point. And anyway, CO2 emissions, if you think of uh, fuel and uh, other emissions in, in the cities and so on, are responsible for uh, millions of deaths in the world because of the pollution. So anyhow, this is the way we have to go uh, in any case. Uh, and this is why the role of cities is so important. So thank you very much, Paolo uh, Petralia Camassa, for being with us. Thanks a lot, if I may. <clears throat> I'm glad to be here. I thank you all for uh, the presentation, for what you're doing, what you're fighting for. This is a common, as we all know, this is a common fight that we need to get into. And uh, one of the main things that we shared with the, with the Stop Global Warming EU initiative uh, is that we immediately connected, as the first city signing this, this initiative, we immediately connected and linked up all the all our contacts and contact points we have all around Europe and all around the world in terms of mayors. Because what Marco Capato just said is very crucial and key for this discussion, for this whole discussion about climate change and not only climate change. Uh, first of all, because uh, cities are and cities administrations are the political political have the political spectrum of local realities and having this political uh, perception cities are the first one who kind of get the consequences of uh, global warming and not only you more in general uh, climate change related issues um, that's why we figured out and we realized cities should immediately link up and uh, get in the same line towards a, a common goal and this initiative is, has been shared with the municipality of Palermo. Palermo has showed his uh, specific political stand uh, towards a better climate uh, and towards these shared goals. And uh, we are going to send up and head out to many other mayors to link them up with us, with, our initi with the initiative of SOP Global Warming, uh, to make a bigger community. And as soon as this community will be bigger and bigger and bigger, and so on. Uh, that will be the time, I would say, and we all think um, global warming can at least get closer as, a, as an issue and as a thing to local communities and citizens. Because so far, what, I, what we face, what we're facing is that there is a matter of generation taking place in this discussion. And I'm not saying that because I'm a young person. I'm saying that because it is true that new generations are, let's say, more concerned about uh, such a problem. But at the same time, uh, there is still, let's say, the limit of states. And states matter a lot in this path. And up until states will not gather around this important problem and this, the main problem, the main challenge of our era, uh, we will not make any step forward. So cities are for sure a basis, a starting point, but also a final point because citizens matter as well. And the awareness of citizens is crucial in this path and for reaching the goal. But at the same time, the call, and we are all concerned about this, should be, uh, should be aimed at 
gaining some sort of uh, um, shared practices by states. There are states, I'm not going to name one because we all know this discussion, there are states who are not at all involved in this process. And this means not having respect for the time, the current time we're living. Uh, as the mayor always says, and as the mayor always argues, one of the uh, definition of populism is people, the populist guy, the populist person is the person who doesn't care about time uh, because he thinks or she thinks, the populist thinks that he can solve and reply uh, and uh, yes, yeah, solve a problem only giving a short answer and a simplified answer. And this means having not having respect for, for the time. That's why Palermo is standing for this initiative as the first city. This is why Palermo is the city that is linking up many other cities all around Europe and not only. And this is also why we are in this discussion all together, sharing practices, sharing uh, a common goal and sharing a common discussion that must be necessarily uh, spread around among uh, different generations. Because once again, I am pretty sure there are generations who are more concerned about this topic and there are generations who don't necessarily care that much and as much as this generation cares. So thanks a lot, everybody, and we're going to be in line for this initiative till the end. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for closing this quickly, but uh, in the next seven minutes, we need to close this panel, open the other panel, and be ready for the next session, which is uh, the Advocates of Carbon Market. So for those of you who are following the Hey Use Tax CO2 initiative, we're going to launch a new live that is going to appear on stopglobalwarming.eu, on the website, etc. And in the meantime, I really want to thank all the speakers that uh, uh, speakers that are citizens, people that care with different roles. I think speaker is a little bit of an euphemism to describe you. So thanks a lot for your contribution. I hope you will follow uh, the program today. You will share with people that might be interested by the different session. But most importantly, I hope we will get this carbon pricing thing done in the European Union as soon as possible. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.